OK, we're now moving on to AC 2.3. In AC 2.2, we were introduced to the five aims of punishment. Uh, now what we've got to look at is how forms of punishment in the UK meet the aims of punishment. So this is much more an evaluation style AC. Uh, so the questions you're going to get on this in the exam are going to be worth more marks. So I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on this and we'll look at the strengths and weaknesses of each of the forms of punishment that we give out in today's society and how they meet those five aims. So if we think about the sentences that are handed down by courts in today's society, and we think about our five different aims of punishment, which are retribution, rehabilitation, reparation, deterrence and protection. And we think about how the syllabus is linked to that statement in the 2003 Criminal Justice Act. We know that as far as sentencing goes in the court, we've got four basic types of sentence that are handed out to punish offenders. And they are imprisonment, community sentences, fines and discharges. So we need to look at these in detail and relate each of the four to the five different aims of punishment. So let's start with imprisonment. Now, prison sentences are handed down by courts for the most serious offences or when a court believes that the public must be protected by removing the offender from society. So straight away you can see I've highlighted the word protection because one of the key things that prison is going to do is protect society. That idea of public protection is key when we're looking at imprisonment. And what I've tried to do as we go through this, I've highlighted in various places where I think uh, the different aims of punishment can be brought in by a candidate who's answering questions in the exam. So again, as this is an evaluation type AC, the more stats, the more evidence you can bring in to support any points that you're making will be useful. So here's a useful stat for you. Almost half of all prisoners in the UK were convicted of sex or violence offences. So straight away, that gives you that idea of public protection. All those people in prison, almost half of all people in prison have been convicted of sex or violence offences. That's why they're locked up, to protect the public. So broadly speaking, we've got three different types of prison sentence. We've got indeterminate and life sentences. We've got determinate sentences and we've got suspended sentences. And any candidate doing this criminology A level needs to understand the difference between the various different types of sentence. So let's start with life sentences. Usually handed out uh, for the most serious punishment. Uh, so you, it's the most serious punishment a UK court could hand down. So it's for the most serious crimes. So there's an element of retribution creeping in there straight away. We know that the judge sets the minimum time the offender must serve in prison before they're considered for release, i.e. parole. So again, there's an element of protection there. And we also know that before they're released on parole, the parole board must consider whether their release is safe or suitable. So again, that element of protection is running behind this. And again, retribution is in the background as well. If they're released on license, they have to follow specific rules and conditions and they have to be supervised by the probation service. For more details on that, look at the PowerPoint on the probation service. So now there's an element of rehabilitation creeping in here. And if they break the terms of the license, they're called back to prison. So there's deterrence now in the background as well. Now, if we look at life sentences, we've got different types. There's mandatory or compulsory life sentences. So, uh, for instance, if someone is found guilty of murder, you have to give a life sentence. The judge has to impose a life sentence. So now we've got retribution, protection and deterrence creeping into those mandatory life sentences. 
Discretionary life sentences can be given for more serious offences such as rape. And again, there we've got retribution, protection and deterrence there. And in most serious cases or some very serious cases, a judge may sentence an offender to a whole life term. In other words, they'll never be released. And that's retribution, protection and deterrence there. Now, why I've got this person here on the bottom left. This is Hashim Abidi. That's the brother of the Manchester Arena bomber. He was uh, found guilty of uh, terrorism offences. He uh, was thought to have helped to have planned uh, the Manchester Arena bombing. And he was sentenced to life with a minimum term of 55 years. So he was 23 year, years old when he's sentenced. So he will not be out till he is 78, assuming he gets parole. He couldn't be given a whole life sentence because he was under 21 when the crime was committed. I suspect, as you will see when I go into life sentences uh, in the next slide or so, that actually had he been over 21, he would have been given a whole life sentence. So whole life sentences tend to be given to offenders who've committed multiple murderers, uh, murders. So we've got, for instance, um, the longest serving prisoner in, uh, at the moment in our prison system is Robert Maudsley, also known as Hannibal the Cannibal. He's killed four people. Three of those were committed whilst he was in prison for a life sentence for a single murder alleged to have eaten part of the brain of one of the three men he killed in prison. OK, so he's been in prison since 1977. He will never get out. Um, she was at one time the only female on a whole life sentence. Since then, another woman whose name I've forgotten at the moment has been convicted and given a whole life sentence. But Rosemary West, she is serving a whole life sentence. She was convicted in 1995. What's interesting here is um, her at the original trial, her trial judge recommended she should never be released. And then the Lord Chief Justice later overturned that, setting a minimum term of 25 years. And then in 97, the Home Secretary overturned that again and reinstated the whole life sentence. So you can see how appeals, etc., uh, have had an effect on the fact that Rosebury West is serving now a whole life sentence. Originally sentenced to whole life, then overturned on appeal and then re-established uh, re by the then Home Secretary in 97, Jack Straw. And then we got this guy here. This is uh, Michael... Adi Baloja, um, he is the killer of Lee Rigby. Um, he, along with um, Michael um, Adi Bawali, um, both men, Muslim converts, killed Lee Rigby. Um, Adi Baloja was sentenced in December 2013, but the, sentence was uh, the actual sentencing was delayed pending the outcome of a High Court decision on life sentences, which was linked to the European Court of Human Rights. And the High Court ruled that whole life sentences were still lawful, providing they're reviewed every 25 years. So Adi Baloja was sentenced to a whole life term, Adi Bawala, a 45 year minimum term, and he's unlikely to be released until at least 2058 when he will be 67. So you've got an idea of the sort of people that are serving whole life terms in our prison system at the moment. Tends to be multiple killers, or in the case of uh, Michael Adibologia, a, um, a, a single act of terrorism, high profile, that really um, upset the public. So acts of retribution here, aims of punishment, retribution is really key here with whole life sentences. Now, when we look at indeterminate life sentences, these are a little more interesting. Now, they were abolished in 2012, so actually no longer can a judge sentence someone to an indeterminate life sentence. But there are still a large number of prisoners serving them because they were convicted prior to 2012. So these set a minimum time that the offender must serve in prison. So there's protection retribution there.
but if this in this case offenders don't have an automatic right to be released that's decided by the parole board so again they're looking at rehabilitation and they're thinking about protecting the public they're usually given or they were usually given if the court thinks the offenders are danger to the public and this in the past has usually been linked to mental health issues but not it's not always the case so there's rehabilitation and protection again in the background so to give you some stats in 2018 10,000 prisoners about 14 percent of the prison population were serving indeterminate sentences determinate sentences the exact opposite to the indeterminate where the sentence is a fixed length of time in 2018 60 to 65,000 prisoners were serving determinate sentences and the way they work is usually if a sentence is under 12 months the offender is normally released halfway through their sentence if it's 12 months or more the offender usually spends the first half in prison and the second half in the community on license supervised by the probation service so there you've got individual deterrence and rehabilitation there if offender is sentenced to less than two years uh, they tend to be released on post-sentence supervision for 12 months with regular meetings with a probation officer and there will be specified requirements in there that might be uh, attend drug rehabilitation uh, live in a specific bail hostel etc etc so again individual and deterrence and re rehabilitation of there with that one if we go to suspended sentences that's when the offender is given a prison sentence but they don't go directly to prison so there's deterrence there and rehabilitation it's usually given if the prison sentence would have been less than 12 months I say usually but there's a stat coming up which you might find interesting sentences can be suspended for up to two years so there's rehabilitation and deterrence there the court might also impose requirements such as probation uh, work or drug treatment. So again, rehabilit rehabilitation is there, which I've spelt wrong, but I'll correct that later. And if the offender doesn't meet those requirements or commits a further offence, the court can send them back to prison to serve the original sentence. So again, a, a massive amount of deterrence is there. So here's the stat I was talking about in 2018. Six 15% of those convicted of an indictable offence, remember they're the more serious ones, received a suspended prison sentence. So actually it's not just for the um, less than 12 month offences, actually quite a few indictable offences end up getting a suspended sentence. Now that now might make you think whether there is retribution here with suspended sentences. Is it fair? So let's evaluate imprisonment. Does it meet those aims of punishment? So let's think about retribution. So retribution is the idea that the offender deserves punishment. The punishment should fit the crime. They're getting their just desserts, etc. So we punish people. Prison punishes people by taking away their freedom. And you could also say imposing some unpleasant living conditions on them. However, if we're going to evaluate, does imprisonment give offenders their just deserts? How do we decide what length of sentence fits the different crimes? In the end, this is a totally subjective opinion. So if it's opinion and it's subjective as to how long someone should have in prison for a specific crime, could you really say there was retribution there? Some may think yes some may think no depending on whether they're for a larger or shorter sentence for a specific crime if we look at deterrence we could argue that the risk of being sent to prison deters would-be offenders from committing crime however high recidivism rates by ex-prisoners suggest that actually it's not an effective deterrent for many i mean here's your stat nearly half of all adult prisoners are reconvicted 
within a year of being released from jail. So if it did act as a deterrent, surely that statistic wouldn't be the case. That statistic seems to prove that it doesn't act as a deterrent. <coughs> so let's now think further about deterrence. And I think you can argue that deterrence only works if offenders are capable of thinking and acting rationally. But we know that many offences are committed under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Many offenders are poorly educated, have mental health problems, etc. So you could therefore argue that prison doesn't act as a deterrent for these type of offenders because they're not necessarily thinking and acting rationally when they commit their crimes. Let's think about public protection now and incapacitation. So obviously imprisonment provides public protection in several ways. Whole life sentences keep offenders permanently off the streets. Prisoners serving indeterminate sentences can be kept in jail for as long as they're deemed a danger to the public. And it would be true to say that in today's society, there's been a trend towards longer sentences. So the public remain protected from offenders for longer. And also, most prisoners are released on license and under supervision. So if they do then become a danger again, because they're on license and they are committing a crime, back they will go to prison. So the public remains protected, you could argue. So many people, though, argue that prison is a school for crime. By going to prison, prisoners actually acquire skills, attitudes and contacts that lead them to offend after their release and potentially to commit more serious offences. Go back to that stat on recidivism, reoffending rates. So are we protecting the public by sending people to prison or actually are we creating super criminals in prison, which actually makes the public more at risk because once they're released, they've got more skills to inflict their crimes on the public. And as I put in that final sentence there, most prisoners are eventually released. So while the prison buys the public temporary protection, actually it may result in greater harm later. And the other thing to consider is keeping prison is, keeping prison is very costly. And some critics argue that these funds could be used to pay for other ways of protecting the public. Remember, the cost of keeping someone in prison for a year in 2019 was £43,213 or £118 a day. So let's now think about reparation. That's allowing the offender to repair the damage caused by the offence either to the victim or to wider society as a whole. Now, under the Prisoners Earnings Act of 2011, prisoners who are permitted to work outside of prison to prepare for their eventual release can actually be made to pay a proportion of their earnings towards the cost of victim support services. So there you have a very good example of reparation. However, in practice, very few prisoners have the opportunity to earn money in this way. So I think I would argue that in general, imprisonment does very little to meet the aim of reparation. If we look at rehabilitation, what we're trying to do there is change an offender so they no longer offend and instead lead a crime-free life. Although it's the goal of imprisonment, actually prisons have a poor record of reducing recidivism. You can use that stat from a few slides ago. 48% of prisoners reoffending within a year of their release. And actually for those who served a sentence of less than 12 months, the figure is 64%. 5,616 prisoners were actually recalled to prison for breaching their license conditions in 2018. All these stats to me suggest that actually prison does little to rehabilitate. But is there another side to the coin? Well, some people say no. They say that short sentences are the reason for this failure. 
nearly a half of all sentences are for six months or less. Now, if you think about this, this means there's not enough time to get to grips with those long term problems that cause offending, such as mental health issues, addiction. And in general, statistics show that short sentences have been found less effective than community sentences at reducing reoffending. Education and training is another thing to consider. Even for prisoners with longer sentence, opportunities to deal with the cause of their offending and prepare them for a crime-free life are often limited. Only a quarter of prisoners have a job to go to on release. This is partly because many lack the education or skills needed. The reality is that you need to train prisoners in a skill that is needed when they come out of society. So to give you an example, if there is a shortage of plumbers in the outside world, it would make sense for prisoners, uh, for prisons to train prisoners in plumbing, because when they go out, there is a need for plumbers and therefore they can get a job and earn money. However, not all prisoners, uh, not all prisons are geared towards that. For instance, if we go to uh, Dartmoor prison, which is near us, um, they tend to do uh, plastering. So they can train people up in plastering, but of course, if, you, if there isn't a shortage of plasterers in the outside world, then they're not gonna get a job. And if they can't get a job, they're much more likely to resort to recidivism. Some of the things to consider there. And the other thing also to consider is, and I found this stat incredible, over half of prisoners have literacy skills of the average 11 year old. So surely one could argue that it's literacy that needs to be dealt with as a key focus in the prison system. Now there is prison education, but hard to do if people are banged up in their cells for 23 hours a day because of a lack of prison officers, etc., etc. So, as I've said before, opportunities for education, vocational training or meaningful work are limited. For example, release on temporary license, ROTL, can allow prisoners out of prison on day release to attend work or training and improve their future job prospects. But oh, fewer than 400 prisoners a month, 0.5% of the population get this opportunity. So does prison rehabilitate? Well, this is a cartoon I took from the US prison system, but I think many people might argue, you can choose to put your own opinion on this, that actually, it doesn't. And if we finally go with addressing offending behaviour, we talked about you know putting people on courses etc to help them address the causes of their um, of their offending. There's a shortage of places on courses that address this behaviour, such as anger management. So many prisoners on indeterminate public protection sentences remain in prison due to the lack of programmes that will address things like their violent behaviour. Think of that stat about how many people are on indeterminate sentences in this country. So let's push prison to one side and look at community sentences instead. So they're imposed for offences that are too serious for a discharge or a fine, but not so serious that a prison sentence is necessary. A community order given by the court will have one or more requirements and these can range from anything such as supervision by a probation officer, between 40 and 300 hours of unpaid work, that's called community payback, a curfew or exclusion order, a residency requirement such as to live in a supervised probation approved hostel, a group programme such as anger management, drink drivers, etc., or treatment for drug or alcohol addiction, including testing or for mental health problems. So, do these sort of sentences meet the aims of punishment? Well, let's think about that. Let's go back to retribution again. Well, all community sentences must include an, include an element of punishment or retribution. For example, curfews and exclusion orders that restrict offenders' movements to certain times and places are a form, undoubtedly, of retribution. 
those that do unpaid work, as we can see from the cartoon, uh, not the cartoon, the picture here, uh, have to wear high vis vests with community payback on the back. So you've got their public naming and shaming, and that again is a form of retribution. If we go back to reparation, I think reparation can include, we can argue that definitely community services reparation, because doing unpaid work to repair the damage the offender has caused to a victim's property would be reparation. Equally, going back to the whole community through unpaid work on community payback, such as removing graffiti, clearing wasteland, decorating a public building, um, are all reparation. If we go back, however, to these other three aims, rehabilitation, deterrence and protection, I think it could be possible to argue that undertaking community payback, if an offender you know, sees the effect their crime has had on the community and as a result is sorry and sees the error of their ways, there might be a re an element of rehabilitation contained within community sentences. However, I think in reality, rehabilitation is much more likely to occur if the offender has undertaken a successful group programme or treatment for drug or alcohol addiction. Whether you can argue that deterrence and protection are part of community services, I think that's harder and I don't think it's actually there. You make up your own mind. Moving on to fines, well, there are financial penalties for offending normally given for less serious offences and therefore most often handed out in magistrates courts. But even with more serious indictable offences, about 15% of those found guilty receive a fine. So it's quite a common punishment. The size of the fine will depend on many factors, but mainly it's these. They'll think about the offence itself because the law will lay down a maximum fine for a given offence. They'll think about the circumstances of the crime, the sentencing guidelines gives a range of options depending on whether it's a first offence, how much harm is done, etc. They'll look at the offender's ability to pay. A poorer defendant will probably receive a smaller fine or be allowed to pay in instalments. And please note, and I cannot stress this enough, at the time I'm doing this presentation, all the textbooks are wrong. They say that magistrates courts have a limit of £5,000 uh, for £5,000 for a fine, that is not the case. That has changed. Magistrates courts now have no limit on the fine that they can impose. So the textbooks are wrong. Please ensure that you understand that in all our courts, there is no limit on the fine that can be imposed. So do fines meet the aims of punishment? Well, there's an element of retribution because hitting someone in the pocket can be a good way to make them suffer for the harm they've done. However, younger offenders under the age of 16 don't have to pay their fines. It actually becomes the responsibility of their parents. So it's hard to see how you can argue that that is retribution. It is the parents that have to pay for the crimes of their children. If we go to deterrence, you could say that a fine can make a, a, a defender, an offender reluctant to reoffend for fear of further punishment. So as the use of fines is a common way of disposing of first time offenders, you could argue that fines are used as a signal that worse will follow if they reoffend, and therefore it does act as a deterrent. With our remaining three, protection, rehabilitation and reparation, well, whilst the money raised from a fine may go some way to giving reparation to both victim and society. For instance, in Devon, uh, if you are caught speeding and have to go on a speed awareness course, I think you pay a hundred pounds to uh, for the privilege. That money, once the um, once the money is paid for the people that deliver the course, any spare money is used to finance the bikeability in courses in Devon. So in a sense, those people who've broken the law, their fines, which pay for the speed awareness course, go to improve road, road safety for younger uh, members of the community. So you, I think you can argue for reparation with fines. However, not sure you can argue so strongly for pre protection or rehabilitation for fines necessarily.
And of course, offenders who fail to pay their fines can face prison. And courts can also deduct fines from offenders' benefits, or they can send in the bailiffs to seize their property in the event of non-payment. However, many fines do not get paid. And I found an incredible stat. For example, by 2016, the backlog of unpaid fines and court surcharges in this country was £747 million. The vast majority of these were written off as uncollectible. So that stat might suggest that fines do not always meet the aims of punishment. Finally, we'll look at discharges. And that's when a court finds someone guilty of a minor, usually first time offence, but decides not to hand down a criminal conviction. And that's when the offender will usually be given a discharge. There's two types and they are a conditional discharge, which means the offender will not be punished unless they commit another offence with a set period of time, which the court will stipulate. If they do so, the court can sentence them for both the original offence and the new one, and that will result in a criminal record. Or there's the absolute or unconditional discharge, which means you've got no penalty imposed. And usually the court may grant a dis an absolute discharge when the defendant's technically guilty, but where the punishment would be inappropriate, usually because the defendant's morally blameless. It's not classed as a conviction. Sorry about my extra words there. So do they meet their punishment aims? Well, I think really the main aim of a discharge is deterrence and, and really nothing else. They're the lowest level of punishment and are in effect a warning as to the individual's future conduct. In general, there's a really low rate of reoffending following a discharge, especially if it's for a first time offence. So probably the cause for many first offenders the experience of simply going to court is enough for them to mend their ways. So I think if I'm going with discharges, I'd only really talk about deterrence and nothing else. Hopefully that all makes sense. So I think I'd argue that in respect, in this respect, discharges do largely meet their punishment aim. So there you have it, the four different sentences that are given out in courts, imprisonment, fines, community service and discharges, all related to the five aims of punishment. You can evaluate however you want, but please ensure you've got some stats, you've got some evidence to support any argument you give, either for or against. I hope that's helped.